his name was Shimada, just okay. Shimada. Just Shimada. Yeah. Okay. So okay. And he was very, you know, very famous and influential in the world of magic. We just lost him. We did, yes. He so, just passed so away sorry. in late April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, but you know he was on the Johnny Carson show like we seven times. That. He was on Dick Cavett. He was on Mark Griffin. He was on all these different shows. Every single magic you know variety show mm -hmm. in the '70s. You know that was the yeah. heyday of show business. Right. Television show, yeah. television entertainment was just thriving yes. back then, right? So he was a household name like worldwide because those shows went wow. all over the world and all through Europe and stuff. And did you know this as a child? Did you feel that, or was I, it just dad? Well, yeah, no, it was, yeah, he was just dad, but, um, but I was aware that we had a very illustrious life. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. From ToastedMarshmallowAdventures.com. And you're watching Toasted Marshmallow Adventures Podcast. Idaho's premier podcast for comedy and entertainment. We know now more than ever, people are looking for ways to escape and laughter is the best medicine. On this show, we talk to comedians and entertainers from around the world. So if you're a fan of stand-up comedy or just looking to take a break from life, we got you. We keep things light and fun, laughing as much as possible with occasional deep, thought-provoking moments intertwined. So if you're in a safe space, grab a cold one. Hit the subscribe button on your favorite audio platform or YouTube. <laughs> Uh, and, share. And, sh and share some laughs with us. We are. Okay, that wasn't right. Yeah. And share some laughs with us. We, we are Toasted, Toasted Marshmallow, Marshmallow Adventures. Adventures. We don't have a hype button. No. Pew, pew, pew. pew. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Wendy. And welcome to the Toasted, Toasted Marshmallow, Marshmallow Adventures Podcast. Podcast. Woo! Today in our Boise studio, we have magician Luna Shimada with us and her son, Adam. Yes. Thank you both so much for Thank being here guys. today. Thank you. Last we... minute. We are so grateful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thanks so much. Which happens a lot it's in huge. podcasting and entertainment. <laughs> yeah, things are last that. minute a lot. So, <laughs> Your uh, show last night. Amazing. Yeah, we loved your show. Loved it. Oh, yeah, it thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're like, oh, I'm my. glad you guys came and saw oh, it. Yeah. So yeah. awesome. I love the music. The whole it was an all encompassing feel. Mm. Exactly. And prior to last night, the last um, magician I'd seen was David Copperfield mm. at the Morrison Center, and I was bummed when I left because I felt like everything was too big, mm -hmm. and he overdid it, and uh, I kind of lost my joy for magic oh. but it's back wow. I, yeah, yeah i feel like it's back well, thank because you, you yeah. yeah you really you you have a whole vibe I mean, it was a whole like I was like, oh, it was it was really magic in way more than a magic way. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. It was a whole, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's and you know the fact that I'm a, a woman as well gives it a, a whole different kind of vibe and feel. But um, but yeah, no, it's just. Uh, there's a lot of female magicians now that are coming into the field, even though it's been primarily male dominated for centuries. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't honestly think there are a lot of women out there that are performing in the kind of vibes, sense and style that I am. Yeah. yeah. Because they are, you know, more following along the commercial vein of what magic entertainment is always been right and um you know whereas i kind of took a very different very alternative path mm -hmm. with my magic journey yeah and so yeah for sure it, I, we can get into that it in seemed while. beautiful you yeah, know yeah you. the movement the music all the songs hit mm -hmm. you know like were perfect mm -hmm. for it was just like oh amazing song right. for what you're doing yeah, yeah. well thing. i i've definitely tried to get away from it being a traditional typical magic show right yeah. and more of a, a an, an atmosphere and an experience definitely mm -hmm. I and, felt that. <laughs> um, you know, with the combination of the stories and just where it kind of goes and, you know, combined with the music and the style and the artistry, because you know, I've, I don't even really fancy myself or see myself as a performance magician anymore, really, but more of a performance artist. Oh, nice. Because mm -hmm. I try to bring all these different elements of music and movement and yes. storytelling into it. Yeah. And the magic just sort of is like you know, just an as an element yeah. to the show, an aspect to it that sort of, you know, 
helps the storyline carry carry through for but, sure yeah definitely yeah when i saw and i've been a fan of magic since i was a kid um i was definitely uh excited that it wasn't just you know a magician up there like oh, do this trick do that mm -hmm. trick yeah the whole performance of it really made it cool for me and seeing someone who's seen a lot of magic shows right. in a lifetime so yeah. it was something different Good. and really enjoyed it yeah. is that yeah, where you cool. came up with the entertainment is yeah. that correct? yeah so i see you did some research yeah we did oh, yeah. <laughs> you got on my website, yeah. <laughs> well yeah because i i i've always felt like you know, magic has always been, especially with the way men perform it traditionally, it's always been this kind of challenge type of, you know, mm -hmm. entertainment or, you know, this whole trickster, catch me if you can right. kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and that never interested me right from the beginning. Right from mm -hmm. the beginning, um, I just felt I didn't like the deceptive aspect of it. I also didn't like the way it made people feel stupid or intellectually challenged. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I really tried hard to create a show that would help the audience get away from the how did she do it kind of mentality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and more into the, the, the experience of, you know, wow. And that's interesting. And that gives me something to think about. And, uh, you know, and just really wanted them to feel sort of the the mystical aspect of it. Oh, you you hit it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because magic is mystical. And here's the thing. I got to a certain point when I was a young girl where I said, well, magic tricks are kind of dumb and silly and mm -hmm. all about, you know, power over, you know, I'm smarter than you. Yeah. I can do this. You know, you try to try to catch me mm -hmm. if you can kind of thing. And it just, it was something that a lot of young boys got into and took an interest in, you know, as a way to empower themselves. They were usually, you know, the kind of boys that felt a little like socially awkward mm -hmm. and a little you know, nerdy or geeky, you know, and we're not jocks and we're not like part of the popular in crowd. Right. So they started learning magic tricks to sort of become more interesting and to, you know, have a power, secret power, superpower yeah. that other people didn't have. And, uh, and so it was definitely, you know, a tool for a lot of young boys to sort of help them build themselves up. And I think that as a girl, you know, we have different interests. We're not preoccupied with the whole ego aspect of trying to fit in and trying to prove ourselves, you know, even though with girls, there's a whole like vanity aspect yes. to it as well. <laughs> so I think that girls just don't get interested in magic until much later on. And for very different reasons, I wasn't interested in magic at all. I mean, I took a mild interest in it when I was about eight and asked my dad to start teaching me. And then he taught me a couple of tricks that were super, super hard. It was almost as if he was challenging me to see if I really had what it took, you mm -hmm. know, to, to, but the magic bug didn't bite me at that time. It just made me feel frustrated. So I gave up and uh, it didn't come back around for me until I was about 16. I started to think, about magic in terms of, well, why do people do magic tricks? I mean, what is the purpose of it? And what are the origins of magic? And that's when I took a real deep dive, you know, into the world of the occult and esoterics. And, mm -hmm. and that led me through, you know, all these different magical philosophies and systems. And it was just a big rabbit hole that I just jumped into mm -hmm. and I immersed myself in those studies. And, you know, took a very spiritual path, mm -hmm. you know, because as you know, a lot of entertainers have a, a, a pretty strong history of, of addiction and drug and alcohol mm -hmm. abuse. And, you know, my family was no exception. You know, I was a child of, uh, you know, alcoholic parents and, you know, a lot of domestic, you know, Un, you know, disturbances. And, mm. uh, and it was just the pressure of being on the road all the time and trying to make it and trying to be, you know, um validated and and uh and so you know as a child and i was a single child at the time i was you know greatly neglected growing up in that situation so i had to raise myself i had to grow up quickly i had to f define what life was going to be life for me like for me and uh instead of going down the addiction path i went down the spiritual path nice mm -hmm. and as soon as i 
asked the question, you know, because like I've always believed in a higher power. I don't know if you want to call it God or Jesus or whatever that is, because I think for every person they have to define uh-huh. who, the, what that is for them, what that means to them, right? But for me, you know, it, the higher power was just some sort of underlying influence, something like I always felt when I would talk to myself that I was talking to something or someone was like, something was listening to me, mm-hmm. you know, because I would ask for things or I would pray for things and, and then it would happen. Like help would arrive. Right. I would meet someone that would have the exact information and the exact mm-hmm. tools that I needed to get me through my next steps. So I learned at a very early age that having that kind of faith almost a blind faith was what was needed, you know, Mm -hmm. and that, that guidance and that, you know, which I think if you remembered my last piece Mm -hmm. was all about that is that along the way we are guided. So nothing's lost, only gained, you know, and life is a journey of happiness and pain. Right. Right. Yes. (laughs) And when you can accept the good with the bad and understand that, you know, that we do live in a dualistic world, but things don't have to be good or bad. They're just, they just are. Uh-huh. You know, life is about just things happening and you get to define what that means to you and how you're going to show up and respond to it. Uh-huh. Right. And um, and that, again, that's part of the spiritual, you know, thinking, right? Getting out of reaction, getting out of victim mode and getting into the that that place where you can truly just assess the situation uh-huh. and, and come from a place of, of, of clarity. So... When I learned about the origins of magic, right? Because I thought, okay, the magic had to come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. It had to. I mean, why do we do it? Right. I mean, we do it now as an entertainment format. That's what's interesting. It's like now it's like you got all these magicians out there that are just like playing to big houses, you know, of audiences. And it's an entertainment. And it has been an entertainment form for, you know, the better part of 400, 500 years since the Dark Ages. And here's why. Way before that time, right, magic was not something that was used as an entertainment. In fact, most people were not even aware that it existed. Magic was used as a way back in those times to show, to convince people that other people or certain people had superpowers. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. How far back are we talking? Okay. Like if you want to go really, really back to like matriarchal times and Mm. shamanism, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, To the medicine women, the healers, they used magic as a, as a, almost a placebo effect. See, they under, they were intrinsically connected to the universe and to the, Mm. you know, to the, to the cycles and the rhythms of the earth. Right. But they also understood something about natural medicine. They understood that our body and our minds are all connected. Everything's connected, our mind, our heart, our bodies are all connected, right? Like like yeah. the earth is connected to the cycles of growth and death and life and rebirth. So in order for someone who is sick, you know, like we say that someone has a disease, but what it really is is it's a dis-ease, uh-huh. right? And the sickness starts in the mind, and then it becomes an emotion. Oh, you know what I mean? Oh, what? I'm sick? Oh, I don't feel well? Oh, Now I'm worried about being sick, right? So now Mm -hmm. the sickness escalates and then the body begins to get the signals from the mind and the, and the, and the emotions. And now the body begins to believe and it manifests the illness Mm -hmm. in the body, right? A lot of times that's how it works. People think that the body gets sick first and then we realize it. It's actually the other way around. It starts as a feeling. It starts as trauma. Mm -hmm. It starts as, you know, an incident that happened to us that then triggered something in our brain that then manifests as an illness, you know, or pain in the body, Uh right? And the shamans and, you know, the ancient healers, they, they understood this because they were connected to that cycle and that rhythm. So they, you know, we had herbs that or our medicine. Medicine comes from the earth. It comes from our plants. You know, that's the uh-huh. gift that the earth has given us is the power of plants. And, um, and, you know, and things like psilocybin, you know, like the mushroom, you know, we are just uh-huh. starting to begin to learn the healing properties of that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, mushrooms are like the, they're the neural network of the plant world. They connect all the roots uh-huh. to all the other plants. See, 
So they're like yeah. the brain of the of the earth. It's amazing what we're starting to finally learn yeah. after all these years. But you know, five thousand years ago, they already knew this, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we're only just starting to remember. Know. You yeah. know, <laughs> they already knew this, and so, but see, we're talking about magic, real magic, on a on a on a, in a in a way that we cannot understand in our present time because we're so logical and we live in a time of science where we need physical proof, mm -hmm. which is why I said in the show, there are two kinds of people, right? The ones that say, I need to see it to believe it. And I think that humans in general, because we don't put a lot of stock in things that we cannot experience with our five senses, you know, and that, that, that sixth sense has kind of been dulled because we're no longer living in the wild where we need to have that instinct, mm -hmm. you know, because of our, our every need is pandered to. And and, yeah. and so we've lost that connection, see? And uh, so we need to have, like, proof that's right in front of our eyes. And right. science does provide that, mm -hmm. even though it's not a perfect science. And a lot of it is just guesswork. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> you know, people think, well, it's science. Yeah, but what is science exactly? It's exactly. a lot of experimenting yeah. and, and hypothesizing, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know. Really um, <laughs> and yet we seem to think that that's the proof. That's fact. It's not fact. What's fact and what you can bank on, what you can trust once you develop the instinct is your intuition, mm -hmm. what you feel. Okay, and that and that feeling is not the same as an emotion, because an emotion is just sort of based on your subjective experience. But a feeling is something that is that feeling, that gut feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is something that's connected to the 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 collective unconscious, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Like danger, danger, and that gives you information, mm -hmm. right? And so, shamans used magic as a way to create to convince the person that was sick oh i'm sick i'm gonna die i'm gonna die this disease so they go to the heat you know they go to the healer and the healer says yes you have poison in your body right now but we are going to extract it from you and then you will begin to heal and everything's going to be fine well how will i know if i'm going to be fine how will i know he says because you will see it you will feel it and you will see the healing take place and so medicine men and women had to be smart. They had to find a way to convince a person that they could heal and that the healing was going to come. You know, the herbs were going to be an assistance, assistance to the body, give the body the nutrients it needs to begin the healing process. But the rest of the healing process has to happen in their mind. Mm -hmm. So how do you convince someone that they have been poisoned right that they are going to get better by drinking this potion right yeah. they need the physical proof so that's why you know someone was very smart and said all right well for example i'm just giving you a an example we're going to take this clear crystal stone we're going to place it here on your stomach you're going to drink the potion you're going to lie down we're going to place a stone on your stomach and then i'm going to sing to you we're going to meditate we're going to do all this stuff we're going to go on mm. a little journey we're going to focus and isolate the poison in your body right 15 minutes later the person opens her eyes the crystal has now turned black <laughs> And the shaman says, look at that. The poison has now been extracted from your body. You have seen it happen. So you are now going to get better. Mm -hmm. That's the placebo effect. Right. You see, it's not about seeing is believing. It's believing and then seeing. Yes. Yeah. No, I love so that. So it comes from the that. other side. Yeah. So that's really the power of magic and how it was used now it was also misused it was also used in nefarious ways mm -hmm. you know magi used it to you know prove to people i have i have supernatural powers i could curse you i could you know i can control you i can mm -hmm. strike you down i can smite you you know and uh and it was used to you know get a lot of people under control mm -hmm. and, and and make them fearful mm -hmm. You know, there's even been some speculation that Jesus even used magic as a way to convince his followers that he had, you know, divine power, mm -hmm. you know, endowed to him by oh, God. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did he walk on water? How did he make a couple, a basket of fish turn in, you know, three right. fish turn into a basket of fish? How did he turn wine, water into wine? Right. Yeah. These are all classic <laughs> magic tricks. I mean, we can do this oh. now. <laughs> and we've always been able to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he did it back in those right. days and people went, oh, my God, yeah. right. son of yeah. God. Right. Yeah. 
And but, you know, the thing was that his message was positive. Mm -hmm. He was using it very much in the same way that shamans used it to empower the people, not to disempower them and not to, you know, make them fearful. He was basically trying to say, I have this power, this power of God within me. But guess what? So do you. Mm -hmm. You can do what I do because every, there's a piece of God in all of us. Right. And that was his real message. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, no matter what religion took it and, you know, changed it and, mm -hmm. and, and modified it. And I don't know how many yeah. people have written that book, but, you right. know, and how, <laughs> and how many of them were actually on mushrooms when they wrote it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you could go back and reread the Bible now and go, wow, okay, yeah. it makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. if, you, yeah. if you look at it in this context. Oh, right? totally. Yeah. Burn but, bush um, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, again, not taking any power f away from it, I think that um, I absolutely honor all people's religious um, paths. Mm -hmm. I think that if it makes you a better person and it gives you a set of guidelines to follow, you know, to guide your life, govern your life by, and, and it helps you, then it's a good thing. Right. And it doesn't matter you know, what your faith is, as long as it helps you become a better person and it gives you those guidelines. Because I do think that we need spirituality. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there who are atheists and they don't believe in anything. But if you don't believe in anything but this physical life and your ego and your pursuits, then what happens after that? Right. Oh, we just die and that's it. We're done. You know, it's like, well, I ain't got news for you guys. I don't think so. <laughs> I think there's more, but you know. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not for us to know. Yeah. See, it's part of the mystery. And, you know, the mystery is, is something that we have to just sort of embrace with blind faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I'm. Yeah, we have long conversations about. Yes, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have well, differing beliefs yeah. in that in that realm, and that's so. okay. That's <laughs> you know, it's it's great to talk about. I yeah. love talking to people that have different beliefs. I love learning something something new. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I am also very interested in another person's perspective. Okay, so why don't you believe in something? Where does that come from? Right. You know, and they'll go, oh, because of this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, but why? Oh, because of this, this, and this. Okay, that's cool, but why? You know what right. I mean? And I'll just keep digging and digging until I get to the gold. Yeah. You know what yes. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny where a conversation will go if you just sit there and not say anything, but just ask the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and just get them to keep like sort of cycling through their thoughts. It's like... And then you get down to the bottom, you get to the, you know, you get a few layers down and then you realize, well, I just I had a bad experience and then I lost my faith and right. this is how it is and this is what I believe now. And mm -hmm. well, maybe it's time to go find that faith again. Yeah. It doesn't have to be religion, but, you know, you got to find something. Yeah. You got to know that every time you step outside and you look into that sky and you listen to those birds and and you see how this planet is, you know, this thriving and that mm -hmm. there's there's something there right that is creating that yeah i'm all there's about a, energy yeah it is it is and you know and everything is energy mm -hmm. and so you know i'm not going to sit there and say there's some invisible man in the sky that makes right. all the rules no that doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah. that doesn't make sense to me I yeah. agree. <laughs> although i don't you know i don't i don't judge anyone that believes no. that but yeah. um but I, I definitely you know believe in the in the science of of quantum physics i believe in energy and i believe in vibration i believe that everything in the universe is math <laughs> right. right it's all numbers and mathematics and geometry and uh yeah. you know when when you want to if you want to scale it right but um it comes down to vibrations my son and i were having a dis uh, conversation this morning about a man named richard turner uh, who's a blind magician. He's been legally mm. blind oh, wow. his whole life since he was a child. He began to lose his vision when he was in his early, you know, around 11 or something. And um, he is, he, his mind, I, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago and he said that his mind has been studied by neurologists and scientists all over the world. They have taken brain scans of his, of his brain. And he said that he has the most highly advanced neural network of almost any man on the planet. 
Wow. Because mm. because he because of his loss of vision and because he continued to um excel at everything he did. I mean, mm-hmm. this man climbs mountains, he does martial he's a black belt martial artist, you know, he is the most amazing card uh cardist, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. uh performer in the world. Um card cheat, you know, he does every I mean he could literally like you could just say, you know, fifty, you know, 23 and he'll just pick up 23 cards with his hands his sense of touch Whoa. is so highly developed mm-hmm. um and i said so since you can't see is you know do you do you feel vibration do you see sound waves and he goes it goes way beyond that you know his sense of his other senses are so heightened to the mm. point where he's almost superhuman right so imagine that that yeah yeah it's like we're so dependent on our five senses mm-hmm. but um I always knew the benefit of of um, that sometimes our eyes can be a real hindrance to us because yeah, we believe so much mm-hmm. about what we see. Right. So when I u- used to practice my magic, I would blindfold myself and I would practice just performing my skills in my hands, mm-hmm. learning where my table was, knowing that, you know, if I move rhythmically and it was it wasn't necessarily that i was even counting my steps it was just knowing intuitively if i move you know in this direction you know this far um that's where my table is Mm -hmm. and so if you noticed last night i almost never look at my hands when i'm performing um no reason to because you know you develop that spatial awareness and then the rest of it is body memory. And mm. I take away my eyesight when I practice so that I can know exactly where everything is and I don't need mm. to see Sense it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But life yeah. is like that too, mm-hmm. you see. So you can scale it down to what you're doing or you can expand it out into the world and just be more aware of everything that's happening around you. Mm. And, um, and so, yeah, I live... You know, I live my life that way. Like, mm-hmm. life, magic for me is not just something I do. It is a way of life. Right. And it's a way of living and it's a way of being in the world. It's a way of looking at things. And mm-hmm. and uh, and once I learned that, once I understood that, that's when I was able to come back to the performance magic mm-hmm. and realize that I had something, you know, yeah, worth doing. Yeah, Definitely. yeah. And yeah, so my son over here, Adam. Okay, yes, it's Adam. <laughs> Sorry, Jam, he's here too. He Hello. is. <laughs> so I come from a magic legacy. Yes, I, yes. I know. You know. My Massive father, one. my father was, you know, quite a, a pioneer in the world of magic, mm. and uh, he came out of Japan, um, and went down to Australia on a magic on you know, a variety tour, and met my mother down there, who was mm. an usher in the theater, and. Uh, you know, they got married and they, she joined his act. And then I was born like shortly after that. So I was pretty much on the ride from the beginning. <laughs> right. So yeah. did you travel with them? I did. I did. Wow. I went everywhere so much so that, you know, I, I barely had any schooling. I, you know, I was mm. in and out of school my whole life. I did maybe like three years of boarding school. Wow. It was probably my most formal educational years. And then after that, you know, I, I got pulled out of school when I was about 14. I never finished high school. Mm. I ended up on the road taking care of my baby brother, who was just a year old at that time, because he was born when I was around 13. Mm-hmm. And um, and then after that, I just went out on stage. and So you, know, you helped with the show? I did. Or? I started performing on stage when I was 11. Wow. Um, before now, that, I did by, a lot of all his Just by stuff. Shimada? Is that what it was? His name was Shimada. Just okay, Shimada. Just Shimada. Yeah. Okay. So and he was very, you know, very famous and influential in the world of magic. We just but lost him. We did, yes. He sorry, just passed so away sorry. in late April. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, uh, but, you know, he was on the Johnny Carson show, like we seven times. He was on Dick Cavett. He was mm. on Mer Griffin. He was on all these different shows, every single magic, you know, variety show mm. in the 70s. You know, that was the yeah. heyday of show business, right. television show. Yeah. Television entertainment was just thriving yes. back then, right? So he was a household name, like worldwide, because those shows went wow. all over the world and all through Europe and stuff. And did you know this as a child? Did you feel that? Or I, was just dad? Well, yeah, no, it was, yeah, he was just dad, but, um, but I was aware that we had a very illustrious life. Mm -hmm. Um, we lived in Hollywood and, um, 
he was a resident magician at the Magic Castle, and a lot of celebrities were members of the Magic Castle. People like Johnny Carson and mm-hmm. Cary Grant and Tony Curtis and Rock Hudson. Wow. You know, these were some heavyweights in yeah. Hollywood at the time. And yeah. they all hung out at the castle because, you know, no public. Mm-hmm. And they all loved magic. They were all fans of magic. And they were all fans of my dad. So, um, you know, and every now and then, my, and my father's, um, ironically, uh, my father's manager at the time was a man named Channing Pollock, who uh, also lived in Hollywood. He lived in Beverly Hills. But um, Channing Pollock was a very famous magician back in the 1950s and 60s. Mm-hmm. And he did a movie called The European Nights, where, you know, he, he was the man that's really popularized and created dove magic, you know, the right. gentleman magician with the doves and cards. My father saw him in the movie theaters when he was like 16. Your dad and, took that further, and though, he, right? It was inspired by Channing Pollock up mm-hmm. on the screen. And he said, that's who I want to be. Mm-hmm. I want to be that guy. Right. So he left Japan to pursue his ambitions in that field. Mm-hmm. And then several decades later, we ended up in Hollywood and Channing Pollock. He met Channing Pollock, his idol. Oh, cool. And then Channing became a fan of my father and said, <laughs> I want to manage your career. So oh, he nice. became that's his nice. manager. Wow, wow. And then cool. we would have these big industry parties at Channing's house or at my father's apartment, our apartment. Um, and all these big celebrities would show up, you know, so we'd be hanging out with, with, you know, Johnny Carson and, you Jeez. know, Cary Grant, they'd be all, yeah. and then my dad got, and I, our, we, you know, our whole family got deported. We went on the Johnny Carson show and by the time he came off stage, the immigration service was oh, waiting for geez. us Holy and crap. escorted us back to the Mexican border. Wow. So then Cary Grant called his attorney that night and said, yeah, we need to get the Shimadas back across the border. So the next day, his lawyer filed a petition, you know, to the immigration service and said, hi, you know, my name's Cary Grant. I'm kind of a famous <laughs> actor. I'm sponsoring the Shimadas, yeah. you know what I mean, wow. into the United States. So he sponsored us and got us back, you know, oh, 48 wow. hours later, that's he got us crazy. back to back into oh, the that's country. Cool. So that's Carrie Grant. Wow. Yeah, 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 wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And the Larson incredible. family, of course, they had a lot to do with that, you know, yeah. helping us get established in this country. So wow, wow, but, that's yeah. really cool. Funny, right? Yeah. So he's so he started it. I followed in the footsteps, but very, very much in a different, you know, in a different mm-hmm. way, um, because I brought my own style to it. I didn't want to be you know, my father's clone Mm -hmm. and my dad made it very clear. You're never going to be like me. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to be. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be. He taught you things? Yeah. Oh. Not really. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned, uh, not saying that I didn't learn from him. I learned from him. I learned everything that I did at that time from him. Just really more by osmosis, though. It Mm -hmm. wasn't like I had formal training from him, it was more like, well, I was his assistant. I set all his props. Right. Yeah. So I knew the mechanics mm-hmm. of it. The rest of it was all just me practicing and learning the skills themselves, right. which yeah. I was able to do effectively on my own. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I developed my own act and uh, started my own career late. I didn't start performing by myself until I was 27 because mm-hmm. I was married to a magician for about 10 years before that. Oh, and um, you know, and I learned a lot of skills from that relationship as well because I was also his partner assistant. Mm-hmm. And then by the time that ended, I was ready to just do this myself. At mm-hmm. first, I was like, "Gee, I need another magician's act to join." And then I went, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! <laughs> I can do this." No, I don't need yeah. another magician. I just need to become the magician. Yes. And yeah. so that's when it started for me. So did you and, have uh, children in the 10 years? I, no, he, no. So I didn't have children in that first marriage, but I did have a solo career for about a while. And then I met, you know, the father of my kids mm-hmm. um, in Austria. He was another magician. That's what I wondered. <laughs> so you come from two magicians. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is yeah. this your path in life as well? Or, um, or not some... the main one at the moment. Right. Yeah. So I was just going to say that because he's too, the third right? generation. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So he started doing magic. I started teaching him magic when he was about eight years old and he okay. kind of took an interest in the building and the engineering side of it with his father. His father's a really good magic creator and builder. Mm. And so it kind of started with that. You know, he was already an entrepreneur by the time he was 10. He was making his own magic tricks out of duct tape. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. It was so funny. So cute. You know? So do you he was perform on your own? Um, yeah. I'm current. I was actually just talking to uh, my mom today, but we're, I'm currently working on just uh, 
creating like a small like uh routine with just like mm-hmm. a bunch of different things like 15 minutes and kind of yeah. going in a more um because i currently i currently make music that's the music recording I'm artist oh, okay. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. so i um I, I mainly make a genre uh called trap metal which basically mm-hmm. Um, it takes elements of rap and metal and punk and hardcore and all those okay. things and kind of puts them together. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to start working on magic that kind of moves into With like music, music oh, that, yeah. of that, of that kind yeah. of stuff that I'm interested in yeah. and working yeah. with and stuff like that. Um, but magic hasn't been center stage for a good a couple good, years. A couple he, years now, yeah. He kind of yeah. stepped away from it for a little while to develop his music mm-hmm. uh, career. So tell him a little bit about uh, yeah. where can the, people what's hear the name? your stuff. Um, yeah, yeah so um, I go by Deadshot. Um, Deadshot? I'm on okay. everything. Uh, okay, Spotify, perfect. Apple Music, all of it. Deadshot. Okay, um, we'll, we'll be checking it out. Up. We yeah. have a massive music fan. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I always look up. Someone yes. posts awesome. something on He's Facebook, on I go and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably part of his playlist. A lot of times, yeah, it does end up on the playlist. So <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's also starting his own like underground scene in Las Vegas. He's already he's already put together. Oh, like, cool. He's already done like three. Has it been three? Three? Yeah, I think three. three events. Shows now. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. So where you guys live now is Vegas? In Las Vegas, yep. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. Do you know DJ Davis? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was he's been on here and he is saying preach and I love what she's talking about. But he is an awesome uh photographer. Yeah. And he's in Vegas now. Yeah, actually in used Vegas. to be here. Wow, cool. So if you need a nice. photographer, yes, yeah. 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 he's we awesome. Should, we yeah. should definitely get <laughs> yes. hook up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah we don't have a picture our, of him. Oh, these ones. He oh, yeah. He photos. took those oh, at a nice. party we did here. At a party we yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah those are great guys 100th awesome. episode yeah. party so yeah he's an awesome photographer so you were on stage last night right yeah you started yeah. the show yeah oh, okay. so i just do like a small intro to yeah kind of, yeah i was like what are we watching it was, it was, i'm not <laughs> well, gonna give first, anything away but it was no amazing. okay yeah we can't do that <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, like, there's a show can, tonight yes come out to a, the show yeah, i always like i always he, and he creates uh, he creates these different characters for the stage yeah the show which it is really intense. cool like the mask that yes. he was wearing last night is something that he's that he made. Yeah. Oh, he's really cool. also a very talented mask maker. Yeah. And mm-hmm. makes and that, a lot of very that's because cool. uh, like character design's always been something that like I've been pretty passionate about. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I enjoy like, like English so much. I love writing stories mm-hmm. and creating characters. So yeah. um, for a minute there, um, and still now, I I got into like mask making and stuff because um, mm-hmm. I wanted to take like characters I was drawing and creating and just kind of developing in my own brain <laughs> mm-hmm. and actually bring them to life. To life. Oh, um, awesome. And the best way to do that was with masks. Yeah. You know, it really, it kind of takes your face away and creates a new character. Yeah. Oh, and it's it, intense. Even just yeah. putting on a mask, you can feel that character almost. Yes. And, um, so I like to, you know, experiment stuff. The um, Experimenting with making a mask and then destroying it and then rebuilding it and putting it on and see how oh, wow. it is, which is the one that I actually wore. Last, uh, last night. night. Last yeah. night, yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, when I walked into that, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. I think I was just <laughs> the right amount of inebriated as well. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. I could watch yeah. this. Yeah. Oh, and we have to tell them about Christina. Oh, so the my. you brought up on stage. Okay. And did the one trick, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So she's a former coworker of mine, oh. actually. And so, yeah, she was. We, you got she a was a massive great. new fan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 She was yeah, so vibrating. I didn't know she was actually going to be here when she went up on stage. I was like, I used to work with her <laughs> at, a, at a psychiatric hospital yeah. here in Boise. Yeah. So, but she loved it. Yeah. She, she was thought blown it was, away. Yeah. 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 But, she was showing us her hand. Afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check this out. Yeah. No, how did it yeah but, uh, it was amazing yeah, it was yeah. great <laughs> yeah really cool. and that's a perfect sort of piece that really points to the ideas that i was talking mm-hmm. about about how the mind can be so powerful and and again going back to this sort of the shaman's uh approach with magic mm-hmm. yeah. is that you know you either are someone that needs to see it to believe it which most of us are or you understand that in order to see it, you have to believe it. Mm-hmm. And so that was really what that piece kind of tries to bring across to the audience because we always say, oh, that's not that that's not uh, mystical. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, what do you think a self-fulfilling prophecy is? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a manifestation of the mind. Yeah. yeah. And what is magic? Mm-hmm. But manifestation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when you study a subject, a topic like, you know, quantum physics, 
you know, you begin to understand that everything in the universe is made up of energy, but it's all like kind of floating around out there and like waves and frequencies, right? And vibration. Mm -hmm. But the moment we put our attention on it, the moment we have an idea, a thought of something, a vision, so to speak, those waves and vibrations suddenly bind together into a particle. Mm -hmm. And that particle, right, becomes the nucleus of a manifestation. Mm -hmm. And so the beginning of a manifestation in Buddhism, we talk about the simultaneity of cause and effect, right? The cause is the vision, the idea, right? Which then creates the particle. The particle now exists in a in-between space between, between you know, uh, the etheric and reality, right? right. That mm -hmm. in-between space is called latent reality, it's the moment where you take the seed and you plant it into the soil, into the deep depth of the soil, right, where it germinates. Mm -hmm. And it does not see the light of day, and, and you almost forget that it's there, right? And you're waiting and waiting and waiting for that seed to sprout, to grow, to break the surface, and it takes a long time. And then you forget about the seed. You forget to take care of it. You forget to water it. You forget to attend to it, right? So it dies, Right. But if you continue to tend to it, look, I know latent reality is just is germination and gestation. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. Every time you have a thought and you keep thinking about it over and over and over again, you are watering that seed. Every you know, so if it's a negative thought right. and it's anger and it's vengeance and it's you know bad feelings, right? You're germinating it every mm -hmm. time, you know, by giving it power and thought and attention. You see. Yeah. And that's what shows up in your life. Mm -hmm. It shows up, it manifests into your reality as an actual mm -hmm. thing. Thoughts become things. Do you so if you... you want to create something good in your life, you want to keep thinking about that good thing that you want so much mm -hmm. and keep watering that seed because right. eventually it'll break to the surface. It'll move out of latent reality into physical, into actual reality. And that's the process of manifestation. And that's if what you the have mind... bad thoughts, do you feel like you can override them mm -hmm. with even fake good thoughts until you believe it? Because um, I sometimes have worries that, like yeah. bad health worries that I notice my brain just doing and I repeat, I'm healthy, I'm healthy. Can that work? It does work. It <laughs> okay. does work. And that's a good thing about, and, and this is why, this is why in this dimension, human beings are not endowed with instant results. This delayed process, this delayed reaction is is necessary in order for us to go through a period of observation and assessment. You see, that's why it's not too late to stop something from happening until it breaks that surface and it shows up in your physical world. Mm -hmm. Once it's here in the physical, now you're going to have to deal with it in a physical way. Okay. But if it has not showed up in the physical yet then you still have time to change your mind or change your frequency mm -hmm. and that will change your outcome. But um, even when it shows up in the physical, you can still deal with it. You're mm -hmm. just going to have to change gears and you're going to have to use different tools and modalities perhaps right. to deal with it. But, you know, but not all is lost, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is a learning experience. And when you learn, when you, when you, when you learn to le take the lesson, take away the lesson from that experience. You can empower yourself to turn everything around. A person can suddenly get diagnosed with stage four cancer, right? And that is years and lifetime of stress and trauma and anger and whatever they've been harboring inside uh -huh. that has been growing and manifesting in their body, festering in their body. Mm -hmm. But once they get that news, oh, you have stage four cancer, you're going to die in three months. Most people are going to go into panic mode and go, oh my God, I'm going to die. And that yeah. just reinforces the outcome. Right. Yeah. But there have been people that have actually experienced simultaneous, uh, spontaneous healing. Mm -hmm. And the way that they do that is they reverse the effects of the cancer by literally reprogramming their neuro network. Mm -hmm. And there are amazing people on the planet right now, light workers, healers, that can teach you these methods. It can teach you how to do yeah. this. It's a combination of changing your diet. It's a combination of changing your lifestyle and your habits along with your thought processes. And you can, in three months, you could completely mm -hmm. reverse the effects wow. of disease Yeah, if you have the commitment and the focus to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I believe that as and well. That's and that's magic. And that's what yeah. we would call a miracle, but yeah. that's yeah. a real thing. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah and it's kind of like, you know, goes along the lines of like, if you know, like the secret and that kind yeah. of stuff, it's kind of like right. mind over matter type of things, believe it and mm-hmm. it's, it'll happen for you. Right. So, but there's a lot more secret. The yeah. secret was a great introduction yeah. to mm-hmm. that kind of thinking for the general public. Yeah, I think but so. But there is a lot more that goes, obviously goes into it than, than that. It's more than wishful thinking. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's really committing yourself on every level. Believe. Mentally, emotionally, yeah. and physically, you know, you got to commit yourself to the work and you've got to do the schooling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, and then you get yeah. the results. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, Adam, how mm-hmm. is it being parented in this metaphors? <laughs> um, I think it's, I, I like it a lot because uh, okay? yeah. <laughs> the, um, the way I've been raised is it's cool because um, censorship was never a thing. Oh, good. Oh, awesome. You know, so I was. Uh, or groundings uh, yeah. or punishment. Wow. Yeah. So it was always kind of just, I just like. just away with all that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was always just like, these are lessons. These are things I'm going to teach you. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. And uh-huh. if you do, you're not going to get punished. You just kind of got to look at it and learn it. So. Yeah. Um, I think uh, as I'm getting older, the more um, I experience things and the more I go through life, the, the more I've really realized how much that's helped me. Uh-huh. Um, it's really shown me like. Uh, how important other people's perspectives are, um, how oh, important cool. it is to, you know, uh, observe my surroundings and observe mm-hmm. what's going on in situations and yeah. just everything. Um, so it's, it's, it's. And understanding people, yeah, right? And understanding meeting, how and meeting them thinks. where they're at. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And how old are you? If we... 16. 16. Oh, wow. wow. Awesome. <laughs> you seem older. <laughs> wise. Yeah. yeah. The wiseness about you. Awesome. Yes. I won't talk, and... bring my kids into no, the no, conversation. No, no. <laughs> they're not a part. <laughs> and I dig your, I dig your Thank look. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Very cool. <laughs> yes. I will definitely check out Deadshot. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> I will. So, awesome. I have some questions, though. So when I was a kid... <laughs> I grew up in Northern California in a city called Vallejo. And one of my favorite things when we went to San Francisco was to go to the magic store on Pier 39 and get just like a new magic trick, you know. And I would use these during school to bet my friends so I could buy a new skateboard or something, you know. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And so, but on your level, Mm -hmm. you're not going to these stores and buying supplies, (laughs) right? You're making your own stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you've got to... So are you building? In fact, something it? happened yesterday. Oh you want to tell them about that? <laughs> yes, yes. So, I'll let Adam tell you the story. Yeah. So um, there's a, a prop in the show, mm-hmm. and we forgot it in Vegas. Oh, no. So it was an important. It's a prop very important. It's prop. the closer oh, to the yeah. show. Oh, um, so we we get there, and it's about I want to say what five hours, five is, five or six hours before showtime, mm-hmm. and we're backstage, and my mom just looks at me and she goes we forgot something oh and i was like what did we forget and then she told me and we were just like oh no so then Mm. immediately she just starts making a new one so then jen was like well what do you need you know can you you know because she's like well what are you going to need to to, because it was the it was the thing that i produced the silks out of to produce jonah which is the final of my show yeah Uh this was kind of a kind of a was kind of an important (laughs) prop so i'm sitting there and i'm thinking okay how am i going to restructure the show and what am i going to you know how am i going to do this that was first thing i was thinking but then jen was like well we have stuff here you Mm -hmm. know what do you need and i said well i'm going to need some cardboard i'm going to need some tape i'm going to need you know uh, a box cutter Uh, she goes i have all that stuff here i have all of it here (laughs) it's all here and she took me down to the workshop and you know we got some poster boards and we got some tape and i'm like okay we're building a new one and i literally in like two hours constructed a completely brand new prop which was the fan that you saw last night remember the big fan yeah 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 okay so that fan i made that in two hours oh wow (laughs) and then he did you know and because he he he's um it was painted right or yeah black and white is that the one we're talking yeah exactly so because he he majors in high school in in video game design and development but part of part of his major is art like uh-huh. he's got to learn how to, he yeah, knows how to draw. It covers yeah. animation and coding oh, and designing cool. and all that. So, so I'm just like, and I can't draw for, right. I can't draw to save my life. So I, I've got, I had this fan, you know, that I was holding and I'm like, okay, we need a fan, but like, we need this. I said to him, but like, you know, three times bigger. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, I got this. So he scaled it out for me and drew it out. And then I was able to cut everything. Wow, and job. then once I finished the construction of the prop, I said, you know, what would be cool after I finished looking at it because it was all just kind of a blank canvas i said you know what would be cool if the symbols that were on the silks were actually on the fan 
and uh, he's like, wow. yeah. So wow. he did that. Oh, so God. he's like, I got this. <laughs> so literally, <laughs> like two yeah. hours before the show, he's drawing a yin and yang, and he's drawing them. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> so we literally. Wow. So yeah. So does that so answer your question? Up. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You <laughs> everything shit. that you see on stage was all self constructed. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Is there a secret magic place? A secret. Haven't we heard? So that? I've I've Chris has I've about watched this. Um, some documentaries, and maybe it might be the. Um, magic castle you're speaking of in hollywood okay. but it's not open to the public it's basically magicians perform and mm -hmm. from what i remember from this documentary is they're basically magicians some of them that don't even perform for the public they just perform for other magicians mm -hmm. uh, is that a place there's a lot of places like okay. that all over Oops. the world in fact every country you know every city has a magic club okay right there are three well, probably more than three, but th the three most well-known magic organizations is the International Brotherhood oh. of Magicians. Mm. They need to change that pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> uh, and then there's the yeah the International Brotherhood, and then there's the um, um, SAM, which is the uh, Society of American Magicians. Mm -hmm. Right, that one's a little better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and then you know we've got all the the different like European clubs and stuff like the Magic Circle in England mm -hmm. and stuff, which did not allow female members into their club until like the last fifteen like fifteen years ago wow. or something. Wow. Twenty years. Yeah, it was really not really quite recent. In fact, that they started to allow women, you know, to join the, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the club. So it's definitely been an old old boys club for a right. long time. Yeah. And uh, and then of course the Magic Castle, probably in the United States, is the most famous like exclusive magic club mm. members club. You have to be. A Although you know you go there it. these days, it's such a huge attraction. It's like most of the people that are there are like not magicians. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like what's going on here? It's, our clubhouse has been taken over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it used to be that place where you know the our the members guests would come and they'd see the shows and as soon as we finished our shows and all the regular guests would cycle out we'd lock the doors and then we would start to party you know yeah. so it's like mm. okay it's 1 a.m the public's gone we lock the doors and now we can just sit at the bar and just talk or do magic for each other and mm -hmm. and that was how it was for years and years when it was a private club right yeah, we were just yeah. Like, and we'd just stay in there until like 4 a.m you mm. know is it but, uh a lot more difficult performing for magicians or is it easier? I don't think, I don't think about it anymore. Okay. I mean, I imagine that for, you know, a lot of magicians, it can be a bit nerve wracking. They get nervous when they're summoned. The only time yeah. I ever got nervous was when my own father was in the audience. Oh, yeah. And wouldn't you know it that every time he was in the audience, I would have a terrible show. Oh, I would mess really? something wow. up. Yeah. I would mess something up. Something would happen. Something oh, would go geez. wrong. And it was just like, you know, hijinks, right? Yeah. Um, but um, but that was the only time I I had been conditioned so you know desensitized I guess after so mm. many years performing for magicians that I just don't think about it anymore. Yeah. Um, I feel, and this may just be a, a subjective thing, but I've always felt because my father was so famous and so beloved by the magic community, and and here I am like his offspring, you know, like trying yeah. to follow in my his footsteps, but not really. But that that's just what people assumed, mm -hmm. and so comparisons were always drawn. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's you know, and I think that there's not been a moment up to this day that I can that a magician has not walked up to me and said, I really love your father. Your mm -hmm. father was such an inspiration to me, and I and I and I love that. I mean, that's great. I'm happy that my father yeah. inspired so many people but nobody ever says anything to me about me oh. right and so it's like that that just sort of became the thing you know mm -hmm. it's like okay i live in the shadow of this mountain yeah. and so and the people only ever see the mountain mm -hmm. they never see the tree that's growing yeah. in the shade of the mountain right right yeah. You know that's growing taller and bigger mm -hmm. and wider yeah. and and all that and and that's okay because again there's that whole pers that two different perspectives right if I were to react to that situation from an ego place, right, which is sort of the humanistic aspect right. of uh -huh. our personality, then, yeah, it would hurt my feelings and it would make me feel all these feelings, which I had for years. Uh -huh. But because I became a more spiritual person, 
I don't have that response, that reaction anymore. And now I just mm. kind of look at it and go, hmm, okay. You know, yeah. it's like, I know who I am now. And so yeah. it doesn't really matter to me as much as it used to, mm. but it has definitely been a stigma yeah, and more of a hindrance, I think, to my, to my career than a, than a, an advantage. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. mm. And I'm not what you would call popular in the magic circles. I never mm. get, I have never been on the cover of a magic magazine like mm. ever. Mm. Okay. And you've done so all these TV magicians within the magic, and... you know, community have never respected me or supported mm, me really? or have given, you know, have, you know, I, I hardly ever, ever get booked on magic conventions, mm. right? Is that because so, of your style or um, because of your dad or? I don't really know, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. It could be a combination of all of those things. Mm -hmm. I know that, that a lot of magic fraternities and magic conventions are controlled by Man. the old boys yeah. clubs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I'm too old. Maybe I'm too fat. Maybe I just don't, you know, I'm not cute enough, young enough, skinny enough, all pretty enough. And all those things <laughs> that, you know, you are supposed to be as a female entertainer. Yeah. Right. But even when I was those things, when I was in my 20s and I was bodybuilding and I had the mm -hmm. body of death and I was gorgeous <laughs> and I had all that stuff going on and and uh, I still did not get the opportunities or the jobs mm -hmm. or the or the mm -hmm. accolades or the support or the awards or the recognition, yeah. right? And that was because I wouldn't play the politics. Right? Oh, okay, you know what gotcha, I mean? I didn't yeah. date the right guys. I wouldn't, you know, mm -hmm. wouldn't rub the right shoulders and right. all that not stuff because- I wouldn't play the game because I was too spiritual for that. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I didn't want that yeah. success. I didn't yeah. want fake boobs. I didn't want to compromise my integrity right. to yeah. for those opportunities. And they knew right off the bat. Also, because I was Shimada's daughter, there were a lot of, that sort of insulated me a lot from a lot of the abuse that was happening. Mm -hmm. Like if you talk to Jen Adams, you know, who grew up in magic as well, right. she could tell you some stories and many other female magicians I know will tell you stories about all the predatory situations that they had been yeah. subjugated to right. within the magic community. It's bad out there and it's mm. bad for young men too. Oh, is it? Yes. And it's something that in that circle has not been openly addressed yet. Mm, you know, but wow. there's, an, but if, if any organization needs a Me Too situation to it's, arise, oh, it's really? that one. Wow. It started to happen a couple of years ago when LA Times published a, an article on the Magic Castle mm. about the about the patriarchy and the situation in oh. there. A couple of uh, cocktail waitresses got, um, were, were, you know, allegedly, um, sexually um assaulted, uh, assaulted yeah. and abused by co-workers mm. and the ceo and the people would not address those issues mm -hmm. you know mm. and so it mm. things started to things kind of broke to the surface mm -hmm. and there was a big scandal but that's all then you know but the there's been a changing of the guard the castle has been mm -hmm. sold and and bought now and uh, and the ownership has been transferred back over to the Larson mm -hmm. family, who were the original founders. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, you know, the the entire organization has is has been getting re restructured now, and all, the, oh. and the person in charge of all that is a woman, is the, oh, daughter, nice. oh, good. the daughter, good good, you know. So she's you know she's definitely you know cleaned up a lot of messes mm -hmm. and is making taking steps to ensure that you know that we have a healthy environment to work in moving forward. Yeah, so, safe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Did uh, COVID um, just kill all your shows during those year <laughs> or two? Well, um, not for me because I'm, you know, I've I've never been a gig performer. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really gigging. I was really working from home a lot. Okay. Uh, I have a private theater in my house. What? Oh, wow. So I was cool. doing a lot of private shows in my home. I was doing, uh, my magic school was there. So I was doing a lot of magic classes. Mm -hmm. I also do a lot of consulting, personal consulting and personal uh, mentoring to other professional mm -hmm. magicians. So, you know, professional magicians come to my studio or my theater and I train them. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I have been... Uh, you know, working at home for, for many years now already because I was a single mom for more than 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when my husband and I broke up, um, my children were very young. Adam was only five and my youngest was three. 
my oldest was eight. So Mm -hmm. I had to be a stay at home mom. I had to figure out how to, I couldn't have a career on the road anymore. I couldn't Mm -hmm. go out. I couldn't leave town and go and do gigs or long contracts out of, out of town. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be here. You know, I couldn't do things like this because I had to stay home and raise my family. Right. So I had to figure out how to work from home. And so that's what I did. I created, Mm -hmm. you know, a school in my house and I created a studio where I, and I did a lot of private shows as well, you know, mm-hmm. and in very underground kind of like old, like they did in the 1800s, you know, yeah. the old parlor shows. Is any of this online which a lot of that anywhere? Happened in, or is this a lot some... of that happened, you know, in uh, yeah. in people's private homes back right. in the days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of a cool thing. And that's what I wanted to sort of revive. And yeah. So COVID, yeah. To answer your question, um, I was probably one of the few people, luckily, that was not hugely affected. Oh, that's because good. Because I yeah. wasn't on the hamster wheel to begin with. Mm. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, is any of the stuff from your home online anywhere? Can people watch it, or is um, it all not really? I mean, no. there was the the Shimada Legacy show was the last big show we did there with my father, and it was cool because it was my kids and me and my father all performing on in the oh. same show together, mm-hmm. and so that was an, an amazing. That's on that, YouTube, or that, that's on YouTube, oh, but it's not the look. whole show. I should post the whole show, I guess, oh, eventually. Awesome. Yeah, but yeah. right now, there's just like a little clip on there cool. that you can okay. check out. And he was sort of like the star of the show because it was really, <laughs> yeah, because it was really about him discovering, you know, discovering magic, and it's a mm. it was a very cool concept because it was sort of an interdimensional. Mm you know where he stumbled into this like interdimensional place yeah where he encounters a witch and a wizard and he begins to awaken to his own innate powers Mm, okay cool take a look at that yeah post the whole thing i'll watch it (laughs) (laughs) now we got to get out of here soon but how did you meet jen was that through magic it was okay and Um, did you know jen's dad i didn't know her no her father had unfortunately already passed away before i met her um, but it was shortly after um, I moved to New York um, because I was uh, working with a, another magician at the time uh, named Jeff McBride, and he was uh, located in New York. So I moved to New York, and he, she was part of his like mystery school group, you know, ma- magic group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I met her through him and his circle in like of your twenties, or yes, I was about twenty. Eight oh, cool. at the time, and she was twenty. So yeah, we were about seven, eight years apart. So she was just a young thing, you know. <laughs> but That's, we hit it off like yeah. right, right off the bat. We hit it off, and um, we became very, very, you know, oh, very close great. friends. And um, yeah, and then we moved out to Las Vegas together because I came from Vegas and I went to New York. But then things didn't work out in New York, so I ended up going back to Vegas, and she ended up coming back to Vegas with me. Um, she wanted to get out of New York too. And, um, and then, you know, after that, we kind of just went our separate ways because she, she kind of went in one direction. I went off in another direction Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I went to Europe and just started touring all over Europe and got on cruise ships. So we just Mm kind of lost touch with each other over the years. Um, she kind of, I mean, we were always there in the background, but she kind of drifted and came out here and I went in another direction and, and then, I don't know, it's like life, this is very typical with me. I have lifelong friends. Right. Mm-hmm. But I will sometimes lose touch with them, like mm-hmm. physical touch with them for years and years and years. But they're always there. Like, right. Like the connection never goes away. It's it's like an invisible cord that just connects yeah. you to these people. And you're right? back when you see and them. And so it's like you know, things cycle back around. Mm. And I just feel like Jen and I sort of came back together this past year, you know, for a reason, you know, we both, we've both had, we both raised children, you know, we're both in very similar situations. Our life really mirrors each other a lot in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're both very similar type women, you know, we're -hmm. we're strong and tough. Yeah. We're strong, (laughs) tough and, you know, know how to just, you yeah. know, focus and yep. get through things. And that's something I think that we both respect and admire about each other. And um, it's some, it's, it's a difficult way to be in this day and age in this kind of time where this cancel culture, where yes. everyone's so overly sensitive mm-hmm. about everything. 
and yeah right it's so bad it's rough it's yeah. rough yes it is you know that you can't even just speak your truth no. and be honest about something mm -hmm. or call somebody out on something nope. that they're doing that's hurting you without yeah. them to without them pointing Flipping at you it. and saying you're being a bully <laughs> yeah. blah, blah, blah. it's like no you're just not willing to face something <laughs> that you yeah. did you know yes. so but that's again that's that's the that's the culture we live in now so that's where the spirituality comes in handy because now you're learning how to you learn how to navigate understand mm -hmm. that okay you know things have shifted and there's sensitivities around everything it's mm -hmm. like everybody is over it's like it, they're not desensitized they're overstimulated now mm -hmm. you know with because yeah. of the access of social media yeah. so much information overload Everybody and has a voice. Everyone's having a voice, but everyone's having an identity crisis at the same yeah. time. So, if you if you if you learn to be sensitive about that, then you know you can just kind of go, okay. Mm -hmm. Truth may not be the safest way to <laughs> to approach uh, beings that are you know I emotional. Yeah. So yeah. you have to find another way around that. Yeah, you know, find another way to reach people. And yes. That's what yeah. I try to do every day. I try to think about how can I reach people in a in a in a in a safe and in a safe way that you know that addresses uh -huh. their needs, right? Um, yeah. And is not triggering, but at the same time gets the message through. Uh -huh. you know, because that's what we got to do. We got to get around these. We got to navigate around these walls, you uh -huh. know. And get the information to them, you know, because like, hey, I'm here to help you, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can't do it by by knocking down their wall because then they're just going to be like, ah, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you got to do it in a gentle way. Yeah, you gotta mm -hmm. find a you got to find a, a very accurate but very effective delivery system. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have three more questions. Oh, okay. Real quick. <laughs> yeah, no. so I'll try to keep my answer short, <laughs> shorter. Uh, so a while back, there was a show on TV where a guy in a mask kind of revealed how like magic. Oh, I wondered were about done. this. Yeah, yes. the mask magician. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How do real magicians feel about this yes. show? <laughs> well, you know, um, a lot of magicians were very, very angry about it. Obviously, mm -hmm. magicians have had a kind of a code. You know, I never did get to address what I was saying earlier about the shamanism and how magic, the origins of magic were created, but then it became an entertainment format in the Dark Ages when the Christians ran around and started murdering everybody for yeah. having magic powers. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, a, a tomb uh, was, was published called the, you know, Discovery of Witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Right. And this book, the, the intention behind this book was to reveal to the public and to the Inquisition and all the offenders that magic was actually just trickery, mm -hmm. you know, and that witchcraft was not, you know, had nothing to do with it. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. And what he was trying to do was save millions of lives yeah. and people from being killed yeah. and executed and tortured, you know, for things that were not what yeah. they were being accused of. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he he uh, published this book to you know reveal look this is you know it's a retractable knife or it's this yeah. or it's that you know and he revealed all these magic secrets so he was in a sense the first mass magician that revealed all the magic secrets and he put it all he published it all right mm -hmm. unfortunately the Inquisition took that book and went hmm interesting we can use these yeah. to prove that these women are witches uh. <laughs> look i'm gonna stab her and she doesn't bleed because uh. they're using a fake knot uh, it ran right. out of me oh, wow. so you know in a way in a way you know he, he was trying to prevent their deaths by proving their innocence but then the the, the yeah. bad guys just used those tools as a way to make them look guilty Oh, you know, wow. they, and that is a perfect example of how magic can be used for nefarious re way, you know, mm -hmm. nefarious ways as well. You know, instead of helping people, it can also, you know, go in the other direction. And um, so the mass magician came out and yes, he revealed a lot of magic tricks. But I think that people were initially angry. I wasn't very happy about it myself. Mm -hmm. But Every time something like that happens, it forces it forces evolution. Okay. You know, one of my favorite quotes is by George Bernard Shaw. He says, the reasonable man adapts to the outside world, but the unreasonable man 
expects the outside world to adapt to him. Mm. Therefore, all progress depends upon the unreasonable man. Mm-hmm. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like he basically took Mm -hmm. magicians, you know, took away their place to hide. It's like, okay, now, you know, there were a lot of really bad magicians out there that couldn't get work anymore because they were doing those old hack tricks that were kind of outdated and getting old and tired. Oh, yes, I do. They were getting old and tired. And, you know, maybe it was time to let some of that stuff go. Maybe it was time to infuse magic with some new ideas and new methods. Now, is this person shunned in the magic world? Was. Oh, okay. he, he was definitely and he was some he was one of our own he was somebody that i knew oh, wow. and, you know worked with many times but i understand why he did it you know and um and so for a payout it was okay. initially he he had some problems with yeah. the irs so he you know they offered him a he, a bailout yeah. and you know and he you know he was only human he was yeah. under a lot of pressure yeah and uh and I, I i guess you know magicians sometimes get to these places where you know their career doesn't pan out it doesn't turn out the way they expect yeah. it to and then they get a little bitter with the community you know and it's just like ah screw it you know i'm taking <laughs> the money i'm taking the money you know whatever um, yeah. Um, whatever their reasons are, you know, they have their reasons. But I think that in the long run, it did force magic to evolve. Okay. So that was the That's a positive that was premise. the positive outcome mm-hmm. of it, you know. And sometimes it's like that. Sometimes something painful, something really crappy has to happen in order for something good to come out of right. it. Mm-hmm. So I think that that was really what, what that was all about. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I used to, I watched that show a couple times, mm-hmm. and you know, as far as being like, well, he revealed f- the linking rings right on one of his episodes. I don't think I saw that. He one. did though. Oh, okay. So if you noticed when you saw my ring routine last mm-hmm. night, well, it's very different from what he. I noticed like yeah. your ring routine was different than ring routines I've seen like, exactly. over the years. Yes, yeah, so right. That so that's yeah. a perfect example of how well yeah. we can't do that trick the way we used yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> better find yeah. another way to do it then. Yeah, so he and made so... you a better magician in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next question, and I've learned from asking comedians who their influences are. They're never like Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle, those kind of things. They're mm-hmm. people that they've met kind of in local scenes and things like that. So for magic, who are your influences? Who um, inspire you? You mean like performance wise or just? Uh, performance wise and as well as like magicians that influence okay, you. Okay. So my, my biggest um, influences were not people that were well Channing Pollock was a big influence mm-hmm. on me not because of his magic or his performance though mm-hmm. uh, he became my metaphysical teacher mm-hmm. because in the later part of his years he became very spiritual and he had this beautiful house on the cliff overlooking the sea mm-hmm. you know, outside of San Francisco it was a sanctuary uh, he had a Chinese wife who did Tai Chi every morning. It was oh, very yeah. spiritual. And they were just those kind of people. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was about 17, I started talking to him and going to his place a lot and just sort of sitting at the master's feet kind of thing. Just wow. We never talked about performance magic a little bit, very, very, very little. But most of our conversations centered around metaphysics and mm-hmm. centered around all the stuff I was talking about today. Right. Mm. He when I told him that I was going to try and become a magician, performance magician, he said, well, you need to learn how to become a magician 24 mm. seven. He says, if you're going to become a magician on stage, you need to become a magician in life. Mm. And that was his first lesson to me. He said that being a magician is not just those five or 10 or 15 minutes or an hour oh, on stage. A great... It's a way of life. Yeah. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at things. You are the writer the creator, the producer of your own movie. Mm -hmm. So you get to write your own story. If you don't like the way your story is going, then you need to rewrite it. Mm. You know? So he handed me a book called The Course of Miracles. That was my first like textbook that I had to study and learn. Mm. And it is 365 days of lessons. Every single day, it teaches you a thought that you have to reprogram in your head. Oh, cool. Mm. And you've got to keep that thought in your head all day long. And you've got to apply it and use it Mm -hmm. in every situation that you encounter throughout the next 24 hours. So it was kind of, it was a, you know, in that book, it took me like three years to to get through it. Oh, did it? Well, it took me two years to read the textbook and one year to do the lessons. Wow. Because it's one lesson per day for a year. Yeah. And, uh, and by the time I finished that, it completely reprogrammed the way I was 
I thought, you know, I thought about things because up until that point, I was a victim. I was such a victim. Right. You know, I can't mm-hmm. leave, I can't you. leave my abusive husband because, right. and you know, and I can't do this because, and I just, yeah. I was just full of excuses and I was a pathetic little thing. You know <laughs> what I mean? Just, just, you know, whining and whining day and night, you know, and he, and then my second teacher was uh, a man named Gandalf. He took the name mm-hmm. from Lord of the Rings, obviously, okay. <laughs> but his name was John. He was this kind of old hippie veteran guy that I met at the park that I used to go walk my dog at all the time. Very cool dude. Mm. You know, used to sit on the bench with him every day, smoke a joint. And he would start (laughs) telling me about the stars and astrology and things. But then as I got to know him better, we got the lessons became deeper and deeper. And he was a wizard, like a true wizard. Like he knew everything about the occult and about esoterics and about the universe. And I learned so much from him. You know, and he was also someone that said, do you know what you look like? When I came to him one day just complaining about my life and everything, he's like, I'll show you. And he stood up and he put his foot on one on the floor and then he started walking in circles. Oh, no. He says, you look like a person with one foot nailed to the floor. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, just pull out the nail, you know. (laughs) And so it's like, you know, I've had some great teachers. So those two, you know, so yeah, John Gandalf, you know, or John Pfeiffer. Um, Channing Pollock were both, you know, very instrumental in helping me become the person I am today. Um, as far as magician influences, um, Rich Yardy was an illusionist from South America. He died many, many years ago in the 80s, but um, I saw him when I was about eight years old. Uh, he was working at the Olympia Theater in Paris with my father in a show, and he was just a phenomenal performer. Like I'd never, ever in my life saw a performer that made my heart beat so hard in my Uh chest, you know, because his energy was so dynamic. He was so powerful on stage and, uh, you know, the adrenaline that that you would feel just watching his performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was very dark. You know, he did a buzzsaw illusion where he literally cut a woman in half with a buzzsaw and her guts and blood went flying everywhere. He basically killed a human being on stage (laughs) and then invited the audience to come up stage and look at it up close (laughs) to verify that it was all real. Wow. (laughs) And then the curtain closed and that was it. No, there was no resurrection. Oh, (laughs) He would float a woman up into the rafters of the theater and then that was it. She's gone. She wow. ain't coming back, folks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the trick that I did in my show last night with the with the orange, the lemon, the egg, oh! and the bird. Oh! That Same. one we've been so, talking about. So yeah, that was yeah. the piece that I saw him. Per- he was the magician that I saw perform that piece for that the first was time. That That illusion. And that was his, like, levity piece. That was his... That was his happy piece mm-hmm. <laughs> in the show that he did. And it was, you know, and it was very humorous the way he did yeah. it. And it was really great. Um, but what I loved about it was that up until that point every magician i watched was very proppy they all had these special magic props you know Mm -hmm. but he came out on stage with three paper bag four paper bags and Mm -hmm. four objects a bird a lemon an egg and an orange and he did this amazing magic you know where Mm -hmm. he just vanished each object and then they all appeared inside each other and in the end he had the bird the egg that he cracked and the bird came out it was like that now that is seriously impossible yeah (laughs) seriously impossible and i snuck into his dressing room after the show and dug through his trash oh did you i did (laughs) and i found the orange and the lemon peelings and everything and i was like okay it's real fruit guys this is ridiculous (laughs) How the heck did oh, you yeah. do this? No kidding. And it was a real bird, you know? So it was like that piece was probably the closest thing I ever came to experiencing that awe and that mystery of magic. So, I'm so glad it stayed with me. Up. It stayed with me my whole life. And when I, when I put my first act together, that was the first thing that went into my show. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, Ricciardi, he was kind of a bastard of a person, honestly, but he was an incredible performer and artist. (laughs) Artist. So I will give him kudos for, you know, for being just an amazing performer. Yeah. That, that was, was incredible. That was one of our favorite yeah. tricks because last night. Yeah. Yeah. During the show, I was like, that orange is fake. And then you peeled it. And I was like, that orange is real. No, <laughs> it's real. It's yeah. real. And I could even throw the peelings into the audience yeah. to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. That and the uh, the fire that turned into the ball that yeah. you rolled this around. Year, it yeah. was, I was like, I <laughs> certainly hope this ends with fire. And it did. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really awesome. Thank you. The yeah. whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Now coming now we mostly interview comedians and some comedians mm-hmm. hate certain certain types of comedy mm-hmm. like some people hate one liners some people don't like storytellers is there a type of magic you despise hmm and then what do you love yeah 
I I don't know if there's any type of magic. Oh, no. <laughs> we got a dog that does that all the time. I don't know what's going on. It's like 3 a.m. Like, oh, shit, we got to let him out. Yeah, He's about to totally. yeah. I don't think there's any particular type of magic, per se, that I don't like. Um, you know, I evaluate ma- I evaluate the magic that I see based on the performer uh-huh. and how they present it. Okay. And um, I, I think for a long time I didn't like close-up magic. Uh-huh. You know, being a stage perf- performer, a stage magician, um, there was a very – there was a hard line between close-up magicians and yeah. stage magicians, right? And they didn't like each other, mm. you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for some reason. They just, you know, they didn't really mix, right? But now that's all different because those everything is all one thing now. That boundary has, like, disappeared. Yeah. Uh, it's blurred away. Um, I think the reason that I found close up magic tedious is because it just, it's mostly card tricks. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of card tricks. In yeah. fact, even now, if you watch a close up magician, it's, it's about 90% cards mm-hmm. and 10% other stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's, it's also very cerebral and you got to kind of really concentrate and you got to keep track. Okay. Where's the card? Oh, it's here. It's in yeah. my pocket. Now it's here. Now it's there. Oh, it's back at the top of the deck again, but I'm going to put it back in the middle, but now it's back on the top again. Yeah. Oh, now it's over here under this car, under this, you know, under yeah. this. And yeah. now it's over. And it's just like, it's it, after about, 15 minutes of that, it starts to feel yeah. really <laughs> tedious for me. Well, even when they use other objects, is it just basically like cards? It's basically hand, the same the, thing. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Now we're doing yeah. it with coins. Now we're yeah, doing it yeah, with exactly. sponge balls. Now we're doing it. Yeah. And, and you'll see a lot of that in magic, even with stage acts. I, I used to call it the diminish and return approach. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and it's 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 like repetitive. But you know, back in the seventies, the thing that was really popular was like these theme acts, mm-hmm. like magic acts. You know, especially stage acts had like themes. Mm-hmm. So like this guy produced nothing but cocktails, right? Yeah. And this guy produces nothing but balls. Right. And this guy produces nothing but you know. So uh, oh, he's doing a pool act. So he's producing billiard balls and cue sticks, and you yeah. know. So it was very very themey, very okay. very nostalgic. You yeah. know, very novel. Mm -hmm. back in those days you know like my father was kind of sort of fit in that category because he was producing doves and parasols Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. the first routine you saw with the parasols is very you know was attributed to him that was that was the type that magic act was something he created but he did it in a traditional japanese way and i did it do it in a totally different style but um yeah so so that's you know that's that's the thing is is that now when I I can watch a close up magician if he is if he's if he's got a good personality and yeah. he's got a good delivery, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of great magicians with great skills. So skills mm. are not something that I necessarily evaluate a magician mm. on. Yeah. You know, what I evaluate on is 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 engagement mm-hmm. and you know how you know how how interesting are you? Yeah. Right. How interesting are you? Yeah. Because if I don't find the person interesting, I'm not going to really find their magic that right. interesting either. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, no, yeah. I get it. Yeah, no, you held us last night through the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> oh, your and dog is so cute. You've lost your dog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the dog that we thought was a monkey. <laughs> yeah. I did last night. I was well, like, is that, that a you, monkey? <laughs> now that I look at it, he does kind of have a, a bit of a bit, monkey yeah, look. Like, I was like, what are those long haired ones? <laughs> yeah, he's kind of got a little bit of a yeah. kind of a capuchin thing going on. Yeah. yeah. He's cute. We are so grateful that you guys came to the lounge and yeah, yeah. and you're on our podcast. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you for having me. The time. It's been fun. I've been ever since I've been here. Let's see, I've done a show. I've done two radio stations. Oh, oh awesome! Yes. Nice. I feel so productive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Sh- another show tonight at eight. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Now, where can people that are fans of magic like? What's the best place for them to go watch? something awesome. uh, i have a, a residency YouTube? at a venue in las vegas called the las vegas magic theater you okay. can find them on instagram and facebook okay. um i'm not there every single night the resident magician is losander he's the owner of the venue oh. so right now it's just him and me performing but i usually come in maybe a couple times a week okay. i also can do performances there upon request so if people want to go book tickets there i think it what is the website it is 
five stars shows.com or something five like that. shows.com i okay. believe but if you just look up or google las vegas magic theater they're on trip advisor event okay. right by it or all of the yeah. ticket brokers and stuff oh. mm-hmm. uh they sell tickets on there and you can book a show you can book a show and come and see me there if you're oh, in las cool. vegas can also follow me on, you know, Luna Shimada 66 on Instagram, mm-hmm. Luna Shimada on Facebook, although I'm really, really not very good at at moderating professional pages because yeah. I tend to be too personal with yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you can follow me on Instagram, but you're going to see a lot of pictures of my dog. Right. And maybe yeah. my yeah. horse. We're the same. Yeah. You know, <laughs> here's a picture of me with my horse today. <laughs> yeah. And then here's another picture of me, you know, having my morning coffee. I think people love that. And, you know, so it's like I use my social media as a kind of a window into my life, yeah. into my world, yeah. like what I call my personal Lunaverse. Right, Lunaverse. Okay. Nice. I am also a poet and a spoken word artist. So, um, oh, cool. in fact, oh. if you don't mind, no, no, go, go for, for it. Um, since we are talking about social media, I would love to share one of my spoken word pieces oh, awesome. with yeah, you definitely. if you're open to yes. that. Mm-hmm. Because it kind of sums up what I'm talking about in regards to social media. <laughs> Are you down? Yeah, yeah definitely, hear it? yes. All right, let me pull that up right here. Okay. And people can find you everywhere. Um, yeah. yeah I, so, and then, oh, yeah, uh, go yeah, ahead. So my music's on everything. Uh, it's Deadshot, all capitals. Um, and then... Uh, D-E-A-D. Uh, yeah, D-E-A-D-S-H-O-T. Awesome. Um, mm-hmm. If you want to be specific, the O is a Nordico, okay. the one with the line in it. So <laughs> okay. that makes it a little easier, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it does. Um, but yeah, and then on, on Instagram. Yeah, I'm on Instagram oh, we'll at uh, Kill em Deadshot. Okay, cool. Kill em Deadshot, okay. Yep. And then yes. YouTube, everything. Nice. Sweet. Yeah, we'll check you out. All right. So you ready? Yes. Yeah. Here are some thoughts from the Luniverse. Okay. <laughs> I just had a realization. I am a total social media whore. I Facebook, I Instagram, I Messenger, I selfie a lot more than I should. I upload daily, I overshare, I text and I FaceTime and I Skype and I Zoom, I podcast (laughs) and I Audible, I Netflix and I Prime, I Hulu and HBO. Well, at Disney Plus and Showtime too. I scroll and I share and I copy and I paste. I block and I ghost. I shop and I buy. I Etsy and I scry. (laughs) I Google and Wiki. I sext for a quickie. (laughs) I'm passive and aggressive, submissive and possessive. I filter and I edit and I crop it and I send it. I am the very definition of a modern cyber, techno-mystic, manic, depressive. (laughs) And there you have it. (laughs) A virtual hologram of reality. And here we are all in it together. So welcome to right now. The future is now the present. Thank you. And I bow. Wow. That's awesome. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That is today. (laughs) (laughs) It really is. Yeah, our reality. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. Almost every day we're like, you got stories. You know, you just got to keep the content grind going. going. Like, what have we done? Well, and... (laughs) Every time I have some kind of deep philosophical thought, even if it's an overshare or something personal, I I put it up yep. there. I yeah. just I do, you yeah. know, because yeah. that's what it is. I think that I just committed myself a long time ago to the idea of being an authentic person, mm-hmm. you know. And I just I really don't have anything to hide. And I right. do have people that like, do you really want to put that up on? And I'm like, yeah, I do. Yeah, because I don't care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I think that's sometimes we talk about that because I'll share a little more than you do, and I get but like, you're like, whoa, no. you're like, and she's like, told me, she's like, I would have never have done that, no. posted that on social so media, and, yeah. And so I'm just like, it all depends on what yeah. you're comfortable yeah. with, and yeah. if you're not comfortable doing it, then don't do it, yeah. But if you are, there might be somebody out there that needs to hear those words, I definitely think that's that true. might relate to it and, th- and think to themselves, and that's what I get a lot of feedback, I get a lot of feedback from people that say, I'm, I've been there or I'm going through it or, wow, your words give me something to think about yeah. and yeah. thank you. And that's why I do it. I do yeah. it because I feel like we are all in this kind of collective situation where it's like if we cannot use our own life as a way to mirror what's happening in the world, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and then and then share that. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, I'm just, I'm just here to help. And right. I'm just here to remind everybody that I'm human, having the human experience like everybody yeah. else. Right. And, 
you know, and that they're not alone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's really cool. So thank you again for being here today. Yes, it's been awesome. We hope you have an awesome show. Yeah. Thank you. This has been fun. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Everybody check out Adam. Yes, Yes. Super glad that he came today. And for sure your music is going to be on in our house. It probably will, yeah. Well, you should listen to it first. Oh, I'm so (laughs) sure. It's pretty intense. I mean, I could probably go with some. I've never listened to Trap punk before so right. who knows it's, it's, it's so funny because when so cool you knowing the guy yeah. you know, <laughs> well, when you look school. at him and you meet him you think yeah. he's like and then you listen to his music and you're like where did that come from, from <laughs> yeah <laughs> now, are, you, <laughs> are you singer are you play um, an instrument i rap sing and oh. scream okay oh, yeah. nice. sing and, scream. and awesome. compose yes. obviously I, can't wait. I can do yeah. everything i bet we listen to it on the way home probably will yeah yeah i'm gonna look it up <laughs> thank you guys awesome so much. yeah all right let's get out of right. here i'm signing out i'm signing off <laughs> i'm chris adams I'm wendy mojo hashtag get toasted stay toasted and thank, and thank you guys you, Luna, so adam have and an awesome jonah Right? Yes. Thank you, star of the show. <laughs>